Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our reading of the Bible, our 52 weeks of reading through the Bible, and we're now at week number nine, day number five, going through Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to be reading today Deuteronomy chapters 19 through 21, so chapters 19, 20, and 21. Chapter 19, when the Lord your God destroys the nations whose land he is giving you, you will take over their land and settle in their towns and homes. Then you must set apart three cities of refuge in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Survey the territory and divide the land the Lord your God is giving you into three districts, with one of these cities in each district. Then anyone who has killed someone can flee to one of those of those cities of refuge for safety. If someone kills another person unintentionally without previous hostility, the slayer may flee to any of these cities to live in safety. For example, suppose someone goes into the forest with a neighbor to cut wood, and suppose one of them swings an axe to chop down a tree, and the axe head flies off the handle, killing the other person. In such cases, the slayer may flee to one of the cities of refuge to live in safety. If the distance to the nearest city of refuge is too far, an enraged avenger might be able to chase down and kill the person who caused the death. Then the slayer would die unfairly since he had never shown hostility toward the person who died. This is why I'm commanding you to set aside three cities of refuge. And if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your ancestors and gives you all the land he promised them, you must designate three additional cities of refuge. He will give you this land if you are careful to obey all the commands I have given you, if you always love the Lord your God and walk in his ways. You see, in the law, obedience to God is connected to how much you love the Lord, how much your hearts are knit with God. And so these cities of refuge provide a refuge to those who can go there if something like this would happen. And you have to think about it. There was no intention to kill someone, but it was, from our perspective, accidental. But from God's perspective, it was allowed within his sovereignty. You have to understand that. And so God is making provisions for that. That way you will prevent the death of innocent people in the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. You will not be held responsible for the death of innocent people. But suppose someone is hostile toward a neighbor and deliberately ambushes and murders him and then flees to one of the cities of refuge. In that case, the elders of the murderer's hometown must send agents to the city of refuge to bring him back and hand him over to the dead person's avenger to be put to death. Do not feel sorry for that murderer. Purge from Israel the guilt of murdering innocent people, then all will go well with you. See, there could be a, a, a murder that takes place that was deliberate, right? Deliberately ambushes and murders someone. And then goes to the city of refuge. Now, the elders of that murderer's hometown must sit in the agents. The city of refuge is not going to be a city of refuge for an, a person who... Uh, commits deliberate murder. So it's it's going back to the status of the heart, the intention of the heart. That's the point of all this. That's the larger point of all this, is to have the people understand that you need to realize what do you believe about God in your heart. When you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession, you must never steal anyone's land by moving the boundary markers your ancestors set up to mark their property. You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness comes forward and accuses someone of a crime, then both the accuser and the accused 
must appear before the Lord by coming to the priests and judges in office at that time. The judges must investigate the case thoroughly. If the accuser has brought false charges against his fellow Israelite, you must impose on the accuser the sentence he intended for the other person. In this way, you will purge such evil from among you. Then the rest of the people will hear about it and be afraid to do such an evil thing. You must show no pity for the guilty. Your rule should be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And so, this goes back that, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. This goes back to that the Lord is laying down the decree. And if someone accuses someone of a crime, both must appear. And, and the judges have to investigate the case thoroughly. And so there has to be proper justice, correct justice in the land. Again, testing the validity of their hearts. Will they honor the Lord or do they not desire to honor the Lord? Chapter 20. When you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, do not be afraid. The Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. When you prepare for battle, the priest must come forward to speak to the troops. He will say to them, Listen to me, all you men of Israel. Do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. Then the officers of the army must address the troops and say, Has anyone here just built a new house, but not yet dedicated it? If so, you may go home. You might be killed in the battle, and someone else would dedicate your house. Has anyone here just planted a vineyard, but not yet eaten any of its fruit? If so, you may go home. You might die in the battle and someone else would eat the first fruit. Has anyone here just become engaged to a woman but not yet married her? Well, you may go home and get married. You might die in the battle and someone else would marry her. Then the officers will also say, Is anyone here afraid or worried? If you are, you may go home before you frighten anyone else. When the officers have finished speaking to their troops, they will appoint the unit commanders. So as you approach a town to attack it, you must first offer its people terms for peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates to you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and prepare to fight, you must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands the town over to you, use your swords to kill every man in the town. You may, but you may keep for yourselves all the women, the children, the livestock, and other plunder. You may enjoy the plunder from your enemies that the Lord your God has given you. But these instructions apply only to distant towns, not to the towns of the nations in the land you will enter. In those towns that the Lord your God has given you as a special possession, destroy every living thing. You must completely destroy the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. This will prevent the people of the land from teaching you to imitate their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. When you are attacking a town and the war drags on, you must not cut down the trees with your axes. You may eat the fruit, but do not cut down the trees. Are the trees your enemies that you should attack them? You may only cut down trees that you know are not valuable for food. Use them to make the equipment you need to attack the enemy town until it falls. God's being very clear here. When they go out to battle, He wants people who are not afraid, 
Do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Don't lose heart or panic. The Lord is going with you. He will fight against you. He will give you victory. Even though there are provisions for those who may not be able to go. It's interesting, the officers will say, anyone here afraid or worried? If you are, you may go home before you frighten anyone else. You see, if you show worry and fear, it's going to have an effect on others. And he gives them the stipulations of how to um, go to war against an, an, an outside army. But he also clarifies, <clears throat> you're going to enter the promised land and you're going to, you're going to have, you must completely destroy these nations because their sin is going to be full. Remember from Genesis? Chapter 21. When you are in the land the Lord your God has given you, someone may be found murdered in a field, and you don't know who committed the murder. In such a case, your elders and judges must measure the distance from the site of the crime to the nearby towns. When the nearest town has been determined, that town's elders must select from the herd a heifer that has never been trained or yoked to a plow. They must lead it down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and that has a stream running through it. There in the valley they must break the heifer's neck. Then the Levitical priest must step forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister before him and to pronounce blessings in the Lord's name. They are to decide all legal and criminal cases. The elders of the town must wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken. Then they must say, Our hands did not shed this person's blood, nor did we see it happen. Our Lord, forgive your people Israel, whom you have redeemed. Do not charge your people with the guilt of murdering an innocent person. Then they will be absolved of the guilt of this person's blood. By following these instructions, you will do what is right in the Lord's sight and will cleanse the guilt of murder from your community. Suppose you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you take some of them as captives. And suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you are attracted to her and want to marry her. If this happens, you may take her to your home where she must shave her head and cut her nails and change the clothes she was wearing when she was captured. Why, does, why is the Lord making that statement? And it says, She will stay in your home, but let her mourn for her father and mother for a full month then you may marry her, and you will be her husband, and she will be your wife. But if you marry her, and she does not please you, you must let her go free. You may not sell her or treat her as a slave, because you have humiliated her. So this is giving a stipulation if something happens on the, where you do take a woman as a captive and you want to marry her. Why? shave her head and cut her nails and change her clothes. Because she can't be living in the situation that she was in before. Those are the externals that of her pagan life. Her life needs to change. Her appearance needs to change. Everything about her needs to change. Suppose a man has two wives, but he loves one and not the other, and both have given him sons. And suppose the firstborn son is the son of the wife he does not love. When the man divides his inheritance, he may not give the larger inheritance to his younger son, the son of the wife he loves, as if he were the firstborn son. He must recognize the rights of his oldest son, the son of the wife he does not love, by giving him a double portion. He is the first son of his father's virility, or virility, and the rights of the firstborn belong to him. So again, God's not endorsing you know, polygamy. He's not endorsing that a man have two wives. And that, that's, that is still breaking the definition of marriage. 
But what he's doing is if that case happens, if that situation happens, there are problems if it does, but it better not affect whoever is the firstborn son. The firstborn son, doesn't matter which woman he came from, the one who is the firstborn from that father um, has the right to the inheritance. And so he's specifying that. He says, suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. In such a case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way you will purge this evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Can you remember in John, the Gospel of John, where um, the man is born blind, and, and Jesus heals him, and he comes to, uh, he has to go into the, uh, the synagogue, and the Pharisees are questioning him, and they call for the parents, and, the, and it's not that the son did anything wrong. But it's, how, it's interesting that they are so against that man. They call him a sinner, you know, and they, they call the, the man uh, a sinner. They call Jesus a sinner. And, and um, you can see the hate in their heart. They're not even following. This, that son is not even rebellious. So this situation in verses 18, 19, 20, 21 wouldn't even apply to this man because he was born blind. He was just sitting there and, and the Lord, uh, Lord Jesus just healed him. But you can see how false the religious system was in Jesus' time and because you can see the heart, the, the evil, the hatred of the people, of the, of the religious leaders. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day. For anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this way, you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. Jesus did not commit a crime worthy of death, but he was executed and he hung on a tree. But he was buried that same night. mainly because it was the Sabbath, the beginning of the Sabbath. But this provision is stated so that Christ would be buried. He can't hang on a tree overnight. There's a lot in here as Moses is telling the people. A lot of various stipulations and various regulations, but they all go back to one thing. God is, is giving them all these stipulations and, and regulations because they are sinners in their hearts. And, he, and, and you can't legislate morality. You cannot um, uh, legislate um, um, obedience. You can command it. God can command it and exhort it. And what God is doing is he's putting this in front of them. All of these laws all of these stipulations, he's putting it in front of them so that they would be exposed to it. It's really his divine revelation. Why? What's the purpose of the law? All of it is to lead people to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfills it in total. Because if you look to Christ... You see the embodiment of, of who God is, and it's God here making these stipulations. It's God here imposing His law upon the people so that they would be different from the rest of the world. But it all hinges on if they will follow the Lord, if they will love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. That's what it depends on. That's what it will always depend on. And we're, we're seeing how that plays out here as we're reading through the book of Deuteronomy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you again for this time to look at your word, to look at your truth. There's so many things here in the book of Deuteronomy, so many things to think about. Lord, as we're just working our way through the text, we see 
that you are revealing yourself, that you're revealing yourself to the people of Israel in a way that would confront them about the status of their heart, about where they're at spiritually. How do they, will they respond to you in obedience? Will they respond to you in faith? Will they obey you? Will they acknowledge that what you're saying is right and just? Or will they come back to you like Eve did, as Satan had tempted her to do, thinking that she had a right and the privilege to question your authority, to doubt your authority, to doubt your truthfulness, and to doubt who you are. It becomes very obvious, Lord, that we have to believe every word you say. We may not fully understand it, but we have to believe it. You are holy, righteous, and good, and perfect at all times. That's why all your promises are secure. That's why you accomplish everything in this world. That's why your will that perfectly takes place in heaven, that we pray it takes place on earth. And your will will take place on earth. You will accomplish every purpose that you have established. You will accomplish your redemption plan. And Lord, I pray that we would always glorify you and praise you in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.